All right, welcome everybody to the CRISP speaker series on privacy. Uh, our speaker today will be introduced by one of our new CRISP faculty members, uh, Mohammed Hajabadi. Professor Hajabadi, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Aravind to you. Um, the first time uh, that I met Aravind was at Eurocrypt 2017, when uh, at a time uh, he was a PhD student in Germany. And uh, after finishing his PhD uh, for a while, he was a postdoc at uh, CMU, uh, working with uh, Elaine Shi, and now he's a postdoc at uh, Entity Research. Um, and I've been following some of uh, Aravind's uh, papers uh, during the last few years because uh, he has been uh, collaborating with people that, uh, that, that I've been uh, collaborating with. So uh, in particular, uh, he works uh, in both uh, applied security areas and also uh, in cryptography. So uh, in particular, he is looking at uh, tools uh, that can be used from cryptography that can solve uh, important uh, security problems. So uh, two of uh, his papers that I found uh, interesting uh, uh, in this area, which are related to uh, cryptography, are uh, one of them is about uh, homomorphic uh, time lock puzzles where you can uh, encrypt uh, some in, in message to the future and uh, you will be uh, able to decrypt it, maybe not now, but uh, sometime uh, in the future. And uh, another uh, paper of his, which is uh, quite recent, uh, was on uh, the first um, uh, construction of a SNARKs uh, based on uh, lattice-related assumptions. And uh, this is another paper uh, that I found uh, very interesting. So what today he's going to tell us about uh, cryptographic tools for cryptocurrency payments. So uh, Arvind, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mama. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, and thanks for the generous introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, you, yeah, you can call me, it's, uh, my my name is pretty long, but uh, you can call me Sri or Aravind or Aravinda, anything is fine. Um, so yeah, let me let me start. So I'm currently, uh, as Mohammed said, I'm a postdoc at NTT. Before that, I, I spent a year at CMU and I did my PhD and master's in uh, Germany. And uh, yeah, in this talk, I'll be talking about um, cryptographic locks for cryptocurrency payments. Um, this uh, is an overarching theme in my um, in my research, which uh, and uh, in this talk I'll be talking about a couple of my works as a sample of this uh, into this larger theme. And my hope in this talk is to convey the key motivation, impact, and um, cryptographic techniques for uh, uh, that that can have immediate impact in these uh, new modern applications. So let me start. Right. Okay. So payment systems of today can be classified into uh, two categories, fiat payments and cryptocurrency payments. And uh, fiat payments are generally uh, backed by a trusted authority like a government or a bank, and they generally have fast processing and are widely used uh, today across the world. But the downside is that the reliance on a trusted authority and stringent rules and regulations for payments. On the other hand, we have cryptocurrency payments uh, that does not rely on a trusted authority and they do not have stringent rules and regulations for payments. And despite slightly slower processing and uh, poor privacy guarantees, both of which are actively worked upon, uh, they are increasingly adopted today. Right? It's, it's currently um, a multi-trillion dollar industry with uh, millions of dollars uh, being invested into new startups and new uh, research uh, divisions to improve these uh, uh, systems. So my overarching research theme is to design protocols with provable security um, for cryptocurrency payments such that we can have better privacy, uh, better efficiency for users while ensuring that the protocol is interoperable or compatible with uh, many cryptocurrency systems that we have today. And uh, it's not a surprise, but the chief tool for security that I would be using uh, would be cryptographic algorithms that have reasonable security and are also uh, practical when used, uh, uh, when deployed immediately. Okay, so uh, just a brief background on how this cryptocurrency payment system work. A cryptocurrency payment involves two users. We have Alice wanting to pay Bob for some uh, commodity, and we have a blockchain, which is a publicly available ledger that is immutable and publicly verifiable. And Alice prepares a transaction and posts the transaction onto the blockchain, and the payment is considered to be made. 
To enable verifiability, a cryptocurrency transaction is of the following structure. It has an input address of Alice, the sender, an output address of Bob, which is the receiver, and some input data and the amount that uh, or uh, value that is to be transferred. The addresses are scripts that are basically pieces of code, and a transaction is considered valid if this input data in the transaction, when executed as input to this, in, uh, this uh, script of the input address, returns one, right? And the most commonly used script in these transactions is that of a verification algorithm of a digital signature scheme. And the script says that you can spend from the address that specifies a public key if you input a signature on the transaction that is valid with respect to this public key. And we have other special scripts as well. For example, we have the lock time scripts that allow the address to be spendable only after some time in the future. Uh, and this is where uh, my work on homomorphic time lock puzzles that Mohammed mentioned will uh, actually came into picture. We have um, hash time lock contracts or HTLC addresses that require uh, a pre-image of some hash value to be revealed uh, before some time for the coins to be spent from the address. And we have more expressive conditions, uh, also known as uh, smart contracts. Using these scripts in, in these cryptocurrency systems, we can realize many payment protocols in, the, in these systems. And these protocols either build a new application with new features on top of these currencies or improve the security and performance of the underlying currency itself. So you have a, these scripts kind of perform a dual purpose where, where you can build something new or improve something that's already existing. But there are uh, some critical issues that come up uh, when you use these scripts in these uh, payment protocols, uh, mainly in terms of privacy, interoperability, and efficiency. In terms of on-chain privacy, a transaction with a special script can be censored, or the coins in this transaction gain what is called a pseudo value as being used uh, in a transaction with a special script, when all other transactions are just using normal, you know, normal authentication methods like a signature script. Uh, the next one you have is that the protocols that require special scripts lack compatibility with many currencies that do not support these scripts. In this case, both the protocol and the currency could lose out on potential benefits. Uh, that they may have if they actually were compatible. Finally, scripts with complex codes um, cost more for the users, slow down the network, and also result in high gas costs in case of Ethereum or transaction fees in, in, in systems like Bitcoin. An example of this was the, uh, the CryptoKitty smart contract a couple of years back that clogged the Ethereum network while driving up the transaction fees of the system. Right. So I, I have three interconnected works in this direction for uh, different payment scenarios where we have uh, cross-currency payments, atomic swaps of uh, coins across different currencies and timed payments to the future. And each of these are fundamental payment scenarios in the real world that, uh, that, quite are, uh, that are quite often used as part of some larger application as well. And my goal is to design secure protocols for these cases with minimal script support so that we can so solve all the problems that I mentioned before in, in a single shot. Specifically, in a work, we actually give a protocol for users to make payments across any currency needing only the lock time scripts and the signature verification script, which is like the most, uh, most common and most basic form of script in all cryptocurrencies. We then give in another work, in a follow-up work, we give a protocol for users to swap multiple assets at the same time across any currency, needing again the lock time and the signature verification scripts. And finally, we show how we can realize uh, payments to the future without needing any scripts at all. And this uh, in turn allows us to remove the lock time script requirement from the uh, previous two payment scenarios. And uh, this was quite surprising uh, the, the technique that we used here was uh, uh, using homomorphic time lock puzzles, uh, which before this work was only used for conventional uh, applications like auctions and e-voting and so on. So we, uh, in this work, we actually said that, okay, this has immediate applications to some, some modern systems like uh, cryptocurrencies. Right. Uh, in terms of theoretical understanding, right? So these protocols show that we can actually pay and swap across currencies, uh, current and future, in a privacy-preserving manner, needing only the minimal 
uh, script support that is a cryptographic authentication. Note that such an authentication is the most uh, uh, is is most is the most basic form of security that you want for a payment. And our protocols are also uh, uh, privacy preserving in the sense that uh, apart from users uh, involved in the protocol, no one can say if these protocols were even executed or who executed them. Right. And in terms of practical consequence. Uh, we give efficient instantiations of our generic blueprints that can be used today to pay and swap across uh, most uh, major currencies that we have currently. And many currencies like um, Ethereum, which is like the, the largest uh, smart contract platform and Monero, the largest privacy preserving currency are um, already actively looking to build uh, like prototypes of our protocols basically. Right. So for the rest of the talk, I will focus on the cross-currency payments that scale uh, well with large networks, and I will show how we can achieve this using only the uh, um, you know minimal footprint on the blockchain, which is like a signature verification. Um, and I will then briefly sketch how the these ideas can be extended to swap coins across uh, multiple currencies as well. Uh, for due to, uh, I, I won't be able to talk about the timed payments, but I welcome you to check out the paper. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so let's look at the cross currency payment. So consider a scenario where Alice, the sender, has to pay Bob every minute for, for some service, and Bob wants it to be uh, paid in a different currency than what Alice uh, is currently using. Uh, it is quite inefficient for Alice to exchange all her coins to the other currency and also post a, a transaction every minute on the uh, respective on the on the blockchain on which Bob is existing, right? Uh, however, if we have uh, two users, uh, Carol and Dave, offering payments uh, in a suitable manner, where like um, Carol Carol wants what Dave, uh, Alice is. Uh, offering, Dave uh, is willing to uh, take what Carol is offering and Bob is willing to take what Dave is offering, which is like the suitable sequential arrangement. Uh, we can set up the payments in this manner, right? And this is in fact shown to be possible if the neighboring users have payment channels between them, right? A payment channel is nothing but a shared address between two users from which the payments can be made to each other in a scalable manner. And a chain or a network of payment channels, which we have in this case, is also referred to as payment channel network or PCN for short. And current proposals require um, special structure in in their in the scripts offered by the uh, on the in, uh, by the involved uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, either in the form of special scripts or signature schemes that with special uh, algebraic uh, structure like like Schnorr or ECDSA or other uh, similar variants in the lattice and isogeny uh, settings. So in this uh, in this work uh, from uh, last year, we actually show that we can achieve a, a payment channel network protocol needing just a, a signature verification script for any signature scheme. And uh, this also means that we can uh, this signature scheme could be a post quantum signature scheme, hash based or or any other signature scheme that you can conjure up, actually. We also bypass uh, important uh, impossibility results to um, achieve the first efficient PCN protocol for the special case of uh, BLS signatures, which is the Pune, Lin, and Sam signatures um, from a couple of dates ago, decades ago, that are highly efficient in practice due to its uh, compactness properties. And uh, it, it has special structure that, that, that is very interesting for the cryptocurrency community. And I will briefly present the generic protocol and also sketch how the efficient instantiation would uh, uh, would follow. For for going into before going into uh, uh, the main protocols, we we have to uh, we we require um, uh, new techniques at the uh, you know at the cryptographic layer as well as like the payment layer. So for this, we uh, we introduce a, a new tool or a technique called lockable signatures, which is a cryptographic uh, tool, and a new payment technique called local three-party channels. And I, I will later show that these two uh, uh, tools and techniques from different layers, how they interact with each other so that uh, we can ensure that Alice, who is the sender here, pays Bob, uh, who is a recipient, successfully, irrespective of the currencies that they are on, and uh, uh, irrespective of uh, how many uh, users in this uh, payment path are corrupt uh, are, are, and are behaving maliciously. Okay, so 
Let's look at the cryptographic tool first, right? So the functionality of this new tool, uh, technique called lockable signatures is that it lets us hide a signature on a message with respect to another signature on another message. Okay, and we have, for this, we have a locked algorithm that takes as input the locked signature and the locking signature and outputs a lock. And the lock can be unlocked using a, a valid locking signature uh, to reveal the valid locked signature. The functionality is 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 pretty simple, but what is this, uh, what is the security that we require from this tool? Is that we require hiding and unlockability. So hiding says that the lock reveals no information about the locked or the locking signature, and unlockability says that given a valid lock and a valid locking signature, we should be able to unlock a valid locked signature, right? So we we essentially want to say that the lock hides all information. And you should be able to unlock correctly if you if you have the correct information with you to actually uh, run the unlock algorithm. Okay, so a, a generic construction where if you if you're locked and the locking signatures are coming from you know any signature scheme, we can actually generically achieve lockable signatures. And uh, in this case, the lock is set as the one-time pad of the locked signature and uh, and uh, uh, and the locking signature, or rather, the hash of the locking signature. Uh, for 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 those of you, this is just 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 a one-time pad of uh, the lock signature. It's, uh, it should be easy to see this. And to unlock, uh, we can hash the locking signature. Uh, once, if you have access to the locking signature, so you hash it, so and then you are able to XOR away and reveal the lock signature. So this is like a generic construction without taking into account any structural properties of the signature scheme. So for the specific case of BLS signatures, as shown here, we can do something similar. Uh, the signature scheme uh, is special because the signatures are compact, uh, they are unique with respect to the given message and a public key, and they are also aggregatable. This means that we can aggregate multiple signatures into a single signature, and this can also be verified efficiently. That is, given an aggregate, you can actually make sure that all the signatures that were aggregated uh, were in fact valid without actually going into each one of them separately. And uh, the lockable signatures for this PLS signature scheme can be obtained by uh, aggregating the locking and the lock signature together. And this is secure because of the property that an aggregate signature that is like an aggregate of two signatures, hides the information about the aggregated signatures. So this is a special property of the BLS aggregation, and we are able to leverage that to achieve lockable signatures. Okay, so that's for the cryptographic uh, tool at the cryptographic layer. Now let's look at what the technique for the payment layer. Right? Uh, so the new payment technique that we introduce is called a local three-party channel, and it works as follows. So let Carol and Dave share a, a payment channel, which is a shared address between them. A shared address is something you can think of it as a public key whose uh, secret, secret key is shared between these two users. So the, the technique says that we can transform this two-party channel into a three-party channel with Alice being the additional third party. And importantly, this transformation is via a, a, a setup transaction where the setup transaction transfers the coins from this two-party channel into a three-party channel and address shared between the three parties. And this setup transaction is not put on the blockchain, but rather it is just kept locally among the parties. And uh, it is immediate from the name that, you know, it doesn't go on the chain. And uh, the third party here, which is the Alice, uh, who will be the sender in our case of the, the payment channel networks, uh, has to additionally authorize uh, or authenticate any transaction that will be spending from this three-party channel. That is the uh, important point to observe here. So previously, Carol and Dave were the only two users to sign uh, and spend from the two-party channel, but now with the three-party channel, Alice has to additionally authorize, right? And this transaction is kept locally. It's not posted on the blockchain. So it does not interfere. It, that is to make sure that it does not interfere with the scalability of our proposal. Okay, so with these two, uh, tools and, uh, and technique, we are able to uh, construct our PCN protocol, and it has three phases. It has a payment setup phase, followed by a payment lock phase, and a payment release phase. Okay, so we have the payment setup phase first, and we assume the users have two-party channels uh, with their neighbors already in the respective uh, currencies. 
Now they transform their two party channels to three party channels locally with Alice being the Alice who is the sender being the third party in all of those uh, transformations. Uh, and notice that each of those channels now will have a setup transaction for them, transforming them into three party channels. And once these tra transactions are set up and signed and, 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 and they're kept locally, we can now start working as if these, uh, as if these channels were actually three party channels. Okay, so that concludes the uh, setup phase. In the next phase, which is the payment lock phase, parties set up the payment transactions that pay from the three party channels to the immediate neighboring right hand, the user on the right hand side, right? And for example, the first payment transaction pays from the three party channel between um, Alice, who is the sender, and Alice and uh, Carol. Uh, because they they originally shared a two party channel, so now you have Alice, Alice, and Carol, and this payment transaction spins from that three party channel to Carol. So that's the first payment. The second one pays from the three party channel between Alice, Carol, and Dave to Dave, and uh, and so on. So the users then set up payment locks. For example, the locked signature of the first lock is the signature on the first payment transaction. And the lock signature on the second lock is a signature on the second payment transaction and so on, okay? And these locks are generated using uh, uh, multi-party computation protocols. A multi-party computation or MPC for short is a protocol that can be run by several parties with private inputs to uh, securely compute some function, right? And we, we require this MPC protocol to guarantee security for the honest uh, parties involved, even if an adversary aborts the protocol in the middle. And, uh, the, and the functionality must ensure that the locked signature of a lock is the locking signature of the previous lock. And here the parties run an MPC so that first Carol receives the first lock followed by Dave and Bob. And in the last lock, uh, if you notice, the locking signature uh, is some, the, that if it is sigma star, is some value that Alice and Bob can compute on some random message. So this is different from all other signatures involved in these locks because they're all signatures on the payment transactions. But sigma star is just some, some signature that the sender and the receiver, that is Alice and Bob, can generate on some random message, which will be useful uh, later for us. Okay, once the lock phase is complete, that is all the uh, payment locks are set up for the payment transactions in this, uh, in this payment path, um, Alice and Bob can generate the locking signature of the last lock, that is sigma star, right? And once this signature is generated, what follows is that Bob unlocks the payment, payment signature right, which is sigma ADB, which is the green sigma ADB. And once uh, he's able to unlock this uh, signature, he's able to put the payment transaction and the signature on the Ethereum blockchain in this case and get one ether from Dave, right? And once this sigma ADB, which is this green sigma ADB is revealed, which is now the locking signature of the previous lock, Dave is able to learn this and unlock uh, sigma ACD, and use this signature, this green sigma ACD, to get the payment from Carol. And similarly, you can, uh, you know, the the cascading effects just just carries on, irrespective of the number of users you have in this payment pattern. So as a result, what happens is Alice, who is a sender, ends up paying Bob via these intermediate uh, payments, essentially. And you may ask why the why these users want to participate in this payment path, meaning Carol and Dave, why should they waste their time? Uh, there is an additional incentive for them to participate because Alice will be offering some some you know some routing fee. A small amount of the payment will go as a fee to these intermediate users, and you know that's why they are willing to participate in this protocol. Okay, in terms of security. Carol in the middle cannot get paid before she pays Dave. And this follows by the hiding property of the lockable signatures. And if Carol pays Dave, she will get paid from Alice. And this follows from the unlockability property of the lockable signatures, right? So we are with these two properties, we are able to ensure that no honest user in the path 
uh, will ever lose coins to to even if everyone else in the path is colluding and uh, is behaving maliciously. Okay, um, and imp an important privacy uh, point that I I think I didn't mention here is that. Um, except for the neighboring users, right? So for example, take the case of Carol, except for Alice and Dave, uh, Bob doesn't know that uh, Carol is actually participating in this payment path. Okay, so it, it's only the neighboring users know uh, that they are in this payment path and anyone you know, further along or further before do not know who's actually participating in the payment path. So that is, uh, that is, that's also an, a, a, a privacy caveat of this protocol. Okay, so um, before I go, so the next I would be presenting the BLS signature specific uh, payment channel network protocol. So before I go into that, I, I just want to pause here and wait for questions. I actually have a question. If if anyone else has a question, of course, um, go ahead and put it in the Q and A box. Um, meanwhile, I actually have a question. So the lockable signatures is. For example, Dave assured that it is in fact unlockable. Like, can Dave just by looking at the locked signature, is he able to independently verify that if he got a signature on his right hand lock, he could use it to unlock his left hand lock? Right. Uh, th yeah, this is actually guaranteed because we are running this MPC with these. Uh, the, the 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 parties that are uh -huh. required right the, the parties that are required for the specific signature so they run an mpc just them not everyone else in the payment but just them and uh, the secu the exact security that you want is is ensured by the correctness of this uh, by the security of this mpc great right. but but um, we we have to we have to get rid of this mpc if we want something efficient and i will show how that we, we can do that for the pls the next slides great are there any other questions? No one's put anything in the Q and A, so let's go on. Mm -hmm. All right. Wait, okay. someone just put something in the chat. Is Alice always the third party in the protocol? Uh, right, the sender. Yeah, the sender. Yeah, it. Uh, the sender is the third party in each of those uh, channels. It could also be the case that the receiver can be the third party, but. For simplicity, we just have the sender to be the third party. Uh, okay, so if if there are no further questions, I would I would also make another pause sometime later, so you, know, you can gather your thoughts and ask the questions later too. Okay, so let me now proceed to the BLS signature specific PCN protocol, and we we have the same three phases like the setup and the lock and the release phase. But now we want to make sure that all of these phases proceed efficiently. And the main uh, efficiency bottleneck of our generic blueprint uh, was that the use of the MPC protocol. And then we want to get rid of that or we want to efficiently instantiate this MPC and we will see how we can do this. Okay, so the first step of doing this is to, is, is to have this the channel, the three-party channel in a structured form, right? So the three-party channel is essentially a, the product of the public keys of the, of the involved parties. So the channel between Alice, Bob, and Carol, the three-party channel, is essentially the product of the public key of Alice, Bob, and Carol, right? So, and and this will help. This this is this will play a crucial role because of the structure of the signature scheme uh, of PLS, essentially. Okay. So the the setup phase proceeds as before of establishing the three-party channels, and now we can proceed uh, to the lock phase, right? Um, and the lock phase also proceeds in a similar way of establishing these locks, but without, without any MPC. So now let's look at the uh, specific case of uh, the lock that Dave receives. And we will exploit the aggregation property of the BLS signatures. Uh, and let's see how. Okay, so in the first step, Carol and Bob send their signatures on the respective payment transactions, uh, the signatures being BLS signatures on the respective payment transactions to Dave. And Dave can verify these signatures. That's fine. In the next step, Alice sends an aggregate of her signature on the two payment transactions, which is the green and the red payment transactions. So Alice sends an aggregate of her signatures uh, on these two transactions. Uh, notice, uh, notice by the security of the uh, aggregate signatures, as I said before, the green sigma A and the red sigma A cannot be retrieved from this aggregate. 
right? So the aggregate hides information about these two signatures. Okay, so once these uh, uh, the signatures, individual signatures, and the aggregate signature is received, they can locally set the lock by aggregating all the signatures that he received along with his own signatures on the two payment transactions, right? So now all these green uh, uh, in this huge product, all these green components uh, uh, constitute the constitute the signature on the payment transaction from Carol to Dave. And all the red components constitute the signature on the red payment transaction from Dave to Bob, right? And uh, we are able to do this because in the previous uh, slides, I showed you the structure of the channel, which was like just a product of the public keys, right? And these two um, play really well together with the, with the signature scheme of PLS. Okay. Now, if we repeat, uh, uh, now the point is, uh, uh, as before, Alice and Bob can together generate Sigma star, right? And um, uh, and all the other signatures, uh, you know, one by one can be uh, just, you know, uh, uh, obtained by just, uh, you know, uh, or in some sense, dividing away the locking signatures from each of those locks. Okay. Now, the security argument is as before, except now that, the, uh, as I said, the BLS signature is unique with respect to the message and the public key. And this guarantees that given a lock and a valid locking signature, that is, that is one and only locked signature that is possible, and that's a valid lock signature. So this, we are able to get this uh, property like information theoretically in some sense. Uh, there's, no, there's no computational argument there. Okay. Now, the, uh, as I said before, this is an efficient instantiation and uh, the uniqueness and the aggregatability property of the BLS signatures, uh, it not only makes our security argument uh, easy, but also helps in efficiency, right? Because, because you are able to aggregate several signatures, uh, that means you can send compact messages. So your communication complexity improves. And because it is unique, that means that once you generate a signature on a message under some public key, uh, you can essentially store the signature and just reuse this whenever you want to communicate uh, again for this message and the public key. In the previous, in any other signature scheme, right, you will have to generate fresh signatures every time. But here you have already generated it, so you can just reuse it. So this also saves computation time for you, and that's how that's why you are able to see, uh, you know, uh, huge savings compared to the current instantiations of Schnorr and ECDSA. And also note that uh, this is the first time that we are able to do something for PLS um, uh, because the previous techniques were simply, uh, yeah, they, they were impossible to be adapted to PLS. Okay, so this, uh, with this, I, I, I will conclude the, uh, the cross-currency payments and I will move on to uh, how you can, uh, in some sense, simplify and as well as generalize in, in different dimensions, the techniques that we just saw to achieve what is called a uh, universal uh, uh, you know coin exchange among different cryptocurrencies so if if you have any questions i'll, I'll just pause I'll give a brief pause here again if you have any questions put in the q q and a and i'll throw in my own again so um whenever you see a a, a joint public key as a product of individual public keys like red flags start going off about the rogue key share attack. So, what do you, what what technique do you use to uh, prevent, like Dave from maliciously choosing his public key to cancel out the components of the other parties? Right. So in 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 our uh, in our implementation uh, in, or in our evaluation, we we just assumed uh, that the users would use uh, proof of knowledge of your uh, secret key. So right. um, of course, uh, th th there are, uh, th th there's, it's an active field of study, right? So they are trying to even make that efficient and not use a proof of knowledge, but though, though you can, you can whatever you do that, you can just take it and plug it in here and you would get the same efficiency gains. So in, at least in this implementation, we use a proof of knowledge. Yeah. Great. There's another question in the Q and A. Uh, who gets paid first in the payment channel once the locks are set up? The first one to get paid is the receiver. So it starts from the right. So the locks get unlocked in a cascading away from right to left. 
So it's a receiver, then the previous guy, the previous guy, previous guy, and it goes till uh, the next guy of the center. So that's the order. Yeah, we want to ensure that you pay first uh, before you get paid. And this is very important. So that's why you go in this order. Um, okay. No okay. other questions, go ahead. Okay, perfect. All right. So yeah, for the rest of the talk, I will just focus on the atomic swap of uh, cryptocurrency coins across any currency, right? Okay. So what is what is this setting? Uh, we have Alice who owns coins of uh, uh, X, Y, and Z. Uh, so you can imagine X, Y, Z to be uh, different blockchains and different currencies. And Bob owns uh, coins in A, B, C, right? Which is, which is denoted in right here. And they want to exchange these coins simultaneously. And uh, as before, we want uh, you know on-chain privacy, uh, better compatibility, and efficient and and better efficiency and better costs for the users. Um, so in this follow-up work, we are we actually uh, um, are, um, give a generic blueprint uh, where we uh, users can sw uh, swap these multiple assets, um, needing only a signature verification from the currencies. And because of this minimal requirement, uh, we are able to cover this uh, this huge, uh, this almost uh, um, the full space of cryptocurrencies. Uh, we also give highly efficient protocols for when the currencies are uh, using Schnorr or ECDSA signatures to verify transactions, which practically covers most of the cryptocurrencies that we have today. Uh, right. So let's look at the one-to-one -one swap case. So let's say Alice has one coin in one currency and Bob has one coin in the other and they want to swap uh, between each other. And the uh, uh, idea is uh, very, uh, you know, uh, very similar to what we just saw before with the cross-currency payments. So the idea is to use payment channels and the payment transactions are set up such that they can pay each other. So the first payment transaction pays to Bob, the second payment transaction pays to Alice. So um, notice, remember that we only have two users now instead of having multiple users that we had for the, the payment channel network case. Okay, importantly, the transactions are set to expire uh, and become invalid after some time so that, if, uh, so that if one of the parties drops out, either Bob or Alice drops out, they want to ensure that the coins are not you know, locked in these channels forever. Right, so these these payment transactions will expire after some time, and this I mean the channels will expire after some time, and then the coins will just go back to their original owner if the other party is just non-responsive. Uh, yeah, so this you can uh, this is fairly immediate if you use lockable signatures that we just saw uh, in the in the previous half, and we actually don't need the three part local three party channels because there is no three party; it's just two parties now, so you don't need that. Uh, uh, that payment technique anymore. For the multi-asset swap case, we first have to uh, jot down the right notion of atomicity, right? Proce like proceeding like before, we we have the payment channel set up and the payment lock set up on the left hand side payments, and, and the notion we want is that for for this lock, so meaning the notion uh, in an abstract sense that you want to ensure that the locks can be unlocked is if Alice is able to get the payment from one of those red channels, right, uh, from Bob, Bob should be able to get all the coins of Alice from the left, okay? And uh, this means that, you know, Alice wants to wait till she can get all the coins of Bob. And once that happens, right, and Alice would get the payment and then Bob can, you know, get all the payments on the left. In any other notion, it is possible that, you know, uh, one of the users only takes uh, not all the coins, but only part of the part of the uh, you know so some some number of coins, but not all. And then you know uh, your uh, notion of atomicity may simply prevent the other guy from getting the required number of coins. It, but with this notion, you say that if Alice, even even if Alice gets one, Bob can get all. And in the protocol later, we will arrange uh, we will set up the protocol in such a way that it's in the best interest of Alice to get all the coins of Bob. Actually, so um, that's that's like the uh, notion that we want to go for. And generically, we can uh, proceed as we did with uh, lockable signatures. That is using the general uh, multi-party computation or two-party computation because we only have two parties now. And specifically for Schnorr and ECDSA, we can replace this uh, this 
this heavy tool of this two-party computation with efficient tools. And I will briefly introduce uh, this uh, tool that we will be using extensively. Okay, so uh, this, this uh, technique is called adapter signatures, and it is a method of encrypting signatures such that we can verify this encryption efficiently. And crucially, if we have access to uh, the ciphertext that is encrypting the signature and the signature itself, we can extract the decryption key. Okay, so in the in the in the picture here, you can think of uh, the small y as the decryption key, and the pre-signature algorithm as the one that is uh, encrypting a signature. So the sigma tilde is the ciphertext that is encrypting sigma. Okay, so you can verify, which is the pre-verify algorithm. So you can verify if everything is uh, generated correctly. You have uh, an adapt algorithm, which is like a decryption algorithm. So given sigma tilde and um, and this decryption key or the small y, you are able to obtain the uh, encrypted signature that is sigma. And the crucial property that I said is that of extraction, where if you are given sigma tilde, which is the encryption, and sigma, which was encrypted, you are a actually able to efficiently derive the decryption key or the small y. Okay, so this is this property is the one that that will play a crucial role for us to achieve atomic swaps needing only signatures. Okay, the security properties are uh, are, uh, are natural that we want the signatures to be unforgeable, uh, even if the adversary has access to uh, these um, uh, encryptions of signatures. Um, and finally, we, uh, we, we want uh, that given a valid decryption key uh, or a valid the small y, we can decrypt and obtain a valid signature. And we also want to ensure that we can extract the correct decryption key if given the ciphertext and the signature. Okay. And we know how to efficient, we know of efficient algorithms for adapter signatures when the signature scheme is that of ECDSA, Schnorr, um, or other uh, variants in, in lattice and isogeny settings. Uh, and we'll be making use of these algorithms in our atomic swap protocol. Uh, but before I go into the details, since this tool probably is new, I'm, I'm just going to pause. And uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please ask. OK, uh, I assume. Uh, it's it was clear, but if if, if not, I'm, I'm I'm happy to answer questions later. Um, right, let me proceed. Okay, I will sketch how our atomic swap protocol works for the case where the currencies use Schnorr or ECDSA signatures for payment authentication, which is practically all the currencies that we have today. The protocol has uh, four phases. We first have the setup phase where parties set up these uh, payment channels or shared keys. Uh, with coins in the uh, with you know with the with coins in the respective currencies, and we let each of these channels expire after some time in the future to ensure that even if one drops out, the other one can get the refund uh, uh, right. And this is to uh, uh, and once once these channels are set up, we can now proceed to the swap block phase. So first, the parties agree on the payment transactions on the green on the left hand side channels which is the green transactions denoted uh, again by the green transactions now the first step is that they generate the encryptions of the corresponding signatures with this uh, with the specific uh, decryption key which is the small y and this small y uh, is actually picked by alice so alice knows the decryption key but not bob okay so they together set up the encryptions of the corresponding signatures uh, of the signatures on the corresponding payment transactions. Okay, so that's done on the left hand side first. And then they proceed to the transactions on the right that are actually paying from Bob to Alice. In, the, in this case, they use uh, with respect to the same decryption key that was the that was used on the left hand side with respect to the same key, they generate the encryptions of the signatures on these payment transactions. All right. Now, since Alice knows the decryption key, she can obtain, or uh, after decryption, so she can obtain the signatures on the right hand side payment transactions because she knows the, the small y, right? So once she can obtain these uh, uh, payment signatures on the right hand side, she can publish uh, the transactions 
uh, on the right and the corresponding signatures that we just uh, derived uh, and get the coins of Bob in the respective ABC blockchains. Okay, since the blockchain, uh, uh, since the ABC blockchains are public and Bob can observe, the extractability property kicks in uh, of the adapter signatures can kick in now. And Bob is able to extract the decryption key after Alice gets her coins. And this uh, allows, once you know he's able to extract, he can also uh, decrypt and obtain all the uh, all the green signatures that were on the that were the signatures on the green payment transactions on the left. Now Bob uh, ends up uh, getting all the coins of Alice as well. Okay. Right. Finally, we have this timeout phase, uh, more like a more like a backup. If one of the parties simply drops out in the middle, and in that case, um, after some delay. Uh, the coins in these channels are refunded back to the original owner if the coins are not already spent from that channel. Okay, um, right. And we, for this, you uh, require the lock time scripts uh, and uh, from the uh, respective blockchains. Um, as I hinted before at the beginning of the talk, we can realize such timeout-based payments uh, without needing any uh, scripts at all. And this means that we have the swap protocol needing only the signature verification. Um, and uh, for this, we are able to uh, uh, use this specific tool called verifiable timed delog or, or a verifiable timed commitment uh, to um, uh, to the to the signatures. Uh, and uh, I won't go into the detail of how we do this, but this is where uh, uh, users are able to create a time lock puzzle of a signature and give it to the other user, and you know the other users guaranteed to obtain the signature. Um, after some time passes in the future, right? So if, if you are able, if you are willing to use this, then we don't need the lock time script at all. So now we can only you can do the swaps only with uh, signature verification. Perfect. So to conclude, uh, we can now pay and swap across uh, any currency in a in a scalable manner, meaning that uh, when you are trying to pay uh, across different currencies to users. You don't have to reflect all the payments on the blockchain. So you only, uh, you know, uh, you you keep all these payments uh, uh, off the chain and only have to reflect uh, a single payment on the blockchain later. So you don't you don't burden the blockchain with the number of payments that you do. So that's why we uh, we call it scalable. And uh, these currencies may be supporting signatures with post quantum security or signatures like BLS signatures that have compactness and uniqueness. Uh, or, or uh, hash-based signatures that are known to be really fast or, or any other signature scheme with any special property the, the currency may be using. And our solution also preserves on-chain privacy in the sense that uh, no information about the users participating in this payment channel network or the atomic swap is revealed on the blockchain. So it's, it, you, you, all transactions that are going on the blockchain just look like regular transactions. And so you can't... Um, um, uh, you won't be able to censor or you won't be able to track uh, transactions, uh, you know, and, and you know, block or uh, demand a higher fee or any of that. You, you won't be able to do it um, anymore. Uh, and also it uh, costs less for the user as he only needs to, um, you know, uh, he only needs to put a transaction on a signature. So there is no other uh, special script that's going on. And because uh, these currencies are usually uh, set up in such a way that you know for you don't pay a high fee if it is just a, a normal signature so the users in these protocols also have to uh, only pay the minimal fee that everyone else in the system is paying okay so what i did not cover in this talk is uh, how we uh, achieve this uh, uh, general uh, generic uh, uh, atomic swap protocol that that can uh, swap across all currencies but what i showed you was just schnorr ecdc which is like most currencies but the techniques that we saw with lockable signatures and the generic blueprint for the cross currency payments can be extended and generalized to get the generic atomic swap protocol as well uh, i didn't go into the details of how we can replace the lock time scripts uh, but i encourage you to um, you know um, stay stay longer ask me questions about it or uh, check out the paper or there are talks uh, online already so i welcome you to uh, have a look and uh, in, in in terms of uh, in terms of future work, we are actually working on. Um, there's a couple of follow works that where uh, follow up works where 
um, I have investigated how uh, if if you can have efficient uh, protocols, if like uh, the, the the currency, if you want to pay or swap across currencies that have different signature schemes, but like concrete signature schemes with algebraic properties. Uh, like for example, one currency is using Schnorr, the other currency is using is using PLS. I mean, natively they are not compatible, but can we can we without going into multi-party computation or two-party computation, can we do something efficient? Uh, and this would be very interesting because there are many currencies that are now looking to use PLS and uh, PLS signature schemes for authentication. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's very interesting to see whether you can transfer assets from one to the other with with all these efficiency and privacy benefits uh the uh the other uh, kind of a long term goal is uh, currently we saw how you can lock a signature with respect to another signature so um it's a, it's a actually a larger question if we can uh, lock other forms of secrets maybe like a decryption key with respect to a signature or or uh, some witness to an np statement you know move from a more theoretical point of view uh, uh, like a witness uh, of an np statement with respect to a signature and so on and see if there are interesting applications that show up um right so yeah so there, there are many other works of mine that fall into this category uh, and uh, as mohammed mentioned there's a, a recent i've worked on uh, lattice uh, lattice based snarks recently that's a recent work of mine uh, even there we uh, in one of the results that uh, we have is we actually give a lattice based uh, adapter signature construction so if you are um, uh, if you are uh, if the if the currency that you are developing is going to have uh, like a GPV signatures, which is like a very fast or a very compact form of lattice-based signatures, we show that actually you can do adapter signatures for that. And then you can, uh, with our techniques that I showed you now, you can do payments and swap across those currencies as well. Uh, right. So yeah, that's it from my uh, talk. Um, I'm open to questions. Okay. Let's thank the speaker. Yay. <laughs> All right, so if there are any other questions, um, please drop them uh, in the Q&A. So the first question is, can you comment on concurrent transactions in this protocol? Um, right, so that, that that's that's actually a good question. So uh, the, there was a, okay. So there was a paper uh, like three years before, three years ago uh, that uh, studied uh, this concurrent payments and whether that whether the, like uh, users could get their funds locked or there is like a, a deadlock problem. Uh, and uh, we we did not actively look into this problem uh, um, when we were working on this paper, but I suspect. Uh, that the techniques that they used uh, in those papers to uh, ensure that there is no deadlock would be can you can you can transport the techniques here too. Um, I don't know the specifics of uh, how they do this, uh, but I, um, I, I we don't do anything radically different from like like structurally we don't do anything radically different from what they did. So I assume it should it should carry over here too. So there shouldn't be like like deadlock problems if there are concurrent payments. Great. Uh, I don't see another question in the chat. Mohammed, did you have? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I felt I felt guilty uh, uh, because Mohammed was mentioning sn lattice snarks, and I was, oh, no, maybe I should talk about that. But it was too late to change my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be another really interesting. Uh, yeah, sure. Topic for... Another time, perhaps. Okay, if there are no other questions in the q a let's thank our speaker again thanks oh, so i i moved to the other room oh, thank you very much in the q a great um okay so uh arvinda will be meeting with uh chris students over in the next zoom room that you should have received a link for um so if you're going to go to that room now's the time Okay, thank you everybody for coming out to the CRISP speaker series on privacy and uh, watch your email for announcements of future editions. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>